Well, hey, family, welcome back. It is good to be with you today. Uh, if you are a guest with us, a very special welcome to you. We are so glad that you would spend a little bit of your time with our imperfect but wonderful community. Uh, Renovation Church is uh, not a place that has it all together, which is good news because that means that there's a place for you. Uh, whether you have come to follow the way of Jesus or whether you are still figuring it out or whether you used to and you're just finding your way back again. This is a place where you can belong even before you believe. Uh, one that you can belong while you work out what you believe. Uh, today, we are continuing our journey in our series, Church in the Wild, with part two of this conversation about gender distinctions. And so if you missed part one, you can find that on our YouTube channel. Uh, this passage was so robust, 1 Corinthians chapter 11, verses 2 through 16. It was so robust, so, so weighty, uh, and needed so much nuanced explanation and getting into the languages uh, that I just did not feel it appropriate to try and tackle it all in one message. I felt that it would have been rushed and it would have been pushed and we would not have had time to really sit in all of the implications. And so, uh, again, if you missed part one that is up on YouTube, but you don't have to miss part two today just because you haven't heard that yet because uh, we're just going to tie it off here now and get to the heart of Paul's entire argument amid these complicated words. Now, where we left off last time is Paul having established clarity on appropriate distinctions between men and women in worship changes his course in verses 11 through 12. And he affirms the theological convictions and teaching that led the Corinthian women to discard their head coverings in the first place. Though men and women have both created order, gender distinctions, and social symbolic gender distinctions, in the Lord, is Paul's words, their distinctions do not place one over the other. Now, this phrase in the Lord means that men and women live in mutual interdependence. It does not mean that the differences between the sexes are abolished, but it does mean that both men and women are radically dependent on God and that they are called to live as complementary partners in Christ. Paul's course change in no way undoes or contradicts what was written in verses 3 through 10. Rather, it renders things more complex than we generally like them. The structure of headship and the way of being that Paul lays out in those verses uh, is now counterbalanced by his considerations and his broader theological framework. For example, the earlier statement that woman came from man is now balanced by arguing that man comes through woman in childbirth. Men and women are not independent, they are mutually interdependent, and we all ultimately come from God, verse 12. Men and women share a horizontal dependence on each other and a vertical dependence on God. And the result in total of Paul's argument, as we noted at the beginning of this two-part sermon, is that Paul champions the functional equality of men and women in the church. Women, he teaches, are gifted, called, and free to pray, prophesy, and exercise leadership of all sorts throughout the guidance of uh, the church and through the spirit. Women are not less, men are not more, not in creation, not in the church. This is Paul's belief and it should be ours. Now, in the final paragraph of this section, Paul briefly adduces two more considerations in support of this position, an argument from nature and an argument from church custom, verses 13 through 15. His appeal for the Corinthians to judge for themselves is not in reality an open invitation to do so. Instead, it is a rhetorical gesture introducing a set of questions that Paul regards as self-evident. Nature teaches, Paul presses, that long hair is shameful for men and glorious for women. Paul's use of nature as a source of behavioral norms has a touch of irony. In keeping with the Stoic and Cynic philosophers of the day, the very philosophical wisdom upon which the Corinthians pride themselves, so the underlying question is, should their own philosophical reasoning not lead them to behave differently? Paul's comments parallel closely to the ancient philosopher Epictetus. And Epictetus writes this, can anything be more useless than the hairs on the chin? Well, what then? Has not nature used even these in the most subtle way possible? Has she not by these means distinguished between male and female? Wherefore, we ought to preserve the science which God has given. We ought not to throw them away. We ought now, so far as lies in us, to confuse not, rather, the sexes, 
because they've been distinguished in this fashion. Now, though he seems to be coming for the hashtag beard gang in his comments, the point Epictetus is making, and Paul ultimately for our purposes, is that nature itself has revealed in due course an extraordinary consistency, the distinction between genders. It seems the Corinthians regarded themselves as having transcended this pattern evident in nature. Does that sound familiar? Their reasons, though, were different from those prevalent in our host culture. In our host culture, the push to bend gender and gender distinctions is born of the culture and born of human desires. By virtue of possessing the Holy Spirit, the Corinthians believed that they could know and do things beyond the capacity of ordinary mortals. Paul's appeal to nature reminds them that they were still constrained by the bounds of finitude while awaiting the return of Jesus. Well, Paul's final words in this section in verse 16 revealed that he is settled on the possibility of continuing contentiousness for the, for the Corinthians on this issue. Imagine that. His last card to play, the big joker, if you will, appeals to the custom of the churches of God. He is not referring to those he planted only, but to every known church in the first century. The hope, perhaps, is that the Corinthians will recognize themselves as belonging to a larger whole rather than as exceptional individuals. And that because of it, they will recognize that they are bound to respect the rhythms and practices in the other churches that were part of this fledgling Jesus movement. But Corinth is going to Corinth. So we can be assured that the labor does not end there. All right. Two weeks, many words later, and we have to ask the question, why? Why should this ancient argument concerning an ancient church wrestling through ancient customs and practice concern us? Well, perhaps... We are bright people, and we don't even have to ask, given the detail through which we muddle along to get to this point. But please be patient with me, as I might be the slow one to the train. As we established at the top of our effort in this text, there's much here that can confuse, dismay, frustrate, and repel people from every sort of background. But what cannot be missed amid all of it is Paul's central point in hope. Paul wants to see a community of honor, fueled by the Spirit, expressed in relationships corresponding to God's created order. Paul's desire is to reform both men and women in the Corinthian congregation who continue to take their Christian behavior cues from the culture rather than Christ. He celebrates the mutual interdependence of males and females and the dependence of all on God. For Paul, equality in Christ has less to do with one who is and more to do with whose one is. All are equally reflections of God and people for whom Jesus died, and thus a sacred person of worth. And none of those truths eradicate the good gift of gender distinction which God created. God made us male and female for his good and our glory. God made us male and female for his, for his glory and our good. Though being questioned in our host culture, the created distinction between man and woman should be honored in the church. Symbolic, philosophical, and now even surgical gender-bending actions in which men and women seek to reject their specific sexual identities are a sign not of authenticity or even of authentic spirituality, but rather a sign of immature impatience with the world in which God has placed us. Consequently, maturity in Christ will lead us to become mature women and men in Christ, and our dress and appearance should appropriately reflect our masculinity and our femininity as given to us by God. And blurring these distinctions not only bends Christ's church to the host culture's will, but it will bring needless shame upon the community and ultimately delegitimize the witness of Jesus' church. In a time of rampant and sometimes hostile confusion about gender identity in our culture, Paul's teaching on this matter is incredibly timely. A healthy community needs men and women, mothers and fathers, co-equal leaders that reflect the full breadth of this God-given mutuality. As an aside, this means that recovering the necessity of the power of women's ministry and leadership in proclaiming the word of God is a must. There's much work for us to do. What then are our next steps? Well, I believe there are only three for those of us who say we belong to Jesus. We must first wrestle with the implications of Paul's words and submit our opinions or even frustrations to the scriptures and not the other way around. Second, we may have to alter our words and our works to reflect what the word says over and against the temptation to bend to the will of our host culture. And finally, we must do the hard work in our own community to work out biblical masculinity, femininity, and mutuality across every sphere, but especially in leadership roles, 
The work belongs to all of us, and doing it well will posture us as a powerful witness to our host culture. Of course, if you would not say that you follow the way of Jesus, then these last couple of weeks have been, let's, uh, let's call it an adventure. I know many of you might just be trying to hold your life together. Perhaps this discussion of gender identity hit close to home in a way that you don't like, and that's all right. There are several things in the Bible that I don't like, but I know I believe them. Whatever your situation, I am sure many things could take priority of mind for you at this moment. But I still want to extend God's invitation to you to know him intimately and be a part of his family. Jesus lived perfectly and then gave his life on the cross to have you know God intimately as a father and for you to be brought into God's family, the church. Jesus gave his life so that, so that you would have hope beyond this life, which places everything else into perspective. That here is not all that there is, but there's more. And he longs for you to have it. Jesus gave his life so that by believing in him, you would have both the means and the motivation to have the abundant life that he promises to do it his way. And all of this is not earned, it's a gift. And the question is, will you receive that gift? Well, if today is your day, then I wanna just pray a quick prayer with you, not necessarily aloud, but just simple words to plead with him for transformation. Would you pray with me? Jesus, you gave your life as a gift to give me so many things. But the most important thing you offer in your sacrifice is you and more of you. You offer me relationship with the Father through you. You offer me eternal life and a new family. So I pray now, give me the gift of faith to believe so that by believing all of those other gifts will be mine and that I will be yours fully. I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Listen, if you prayed that prayer, then after our gathering, please connect with someone in the chat they would love to pray with you and help you take a next step um, right from our digital lobby. And if you're watching this on demand, which I know that many of you are, then please text, I have become a Christian to 94000 and our team will follow up with you within this week. As I said at the top of our time, when we began this couple week journey, um, I was never able to persuade all of those students that Paul was not a woman-hating bigot. And I'm not sure I've persuaded all of you. I also do not know if I've actually done justice to this very complex argument that Paul constructed on this matter. Time and posterity will eventually reveal all. What I do know for sure is that the heart of Paul's message, the beauty of interdependent mutuality, between fully expressed and fully redeemed femininity and masculinity is not only at the heart of God's desire for his children, but it's at the very core of our vision. I know that we have not even begun to realize our vision and mission, but what if we committed to do so today? What if we start with doing this work right here, affirming, fighting for, and living out biblical interdependence and mutuality in our community? Not only will we be one step closer to realizing God's vision for our church, but we will be one step closer to seeing more of his kingdom. So the question I have for you is, are you ready?